Hello, third graders. We are going to finish our book this week. We've got the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Uh, this is chapter XIV. So that would be chapter XIV. 14, right? The beginning of the end of the world. Slowly the door opened and again, uh, opened again, and out there came a figure as tall and straight as the girls, but not so slender. It carried no light, but the light seemed to come from it. As it came nearer, Lucy saw that it was like an old man. His silver beard came down to his bare feet in front, and his silver hair hung down to his heels behind, and the robe appeared to be made of fleece of silver sheep. He looked so mild and grave that at once, that once more, all the travelers rose to their feet and stood in silence. But the old man came on without speaking to the travelers and stood on the other side of the table opposite his daughter. Then both of them held up their arms before them and turned to face the east. In that position, they began to sing. I wish I could write down the song, but no one who was present could remember it. Lucy said afterwards that it was high, almost shrill, but very beautiful. A cold kind of song, an early morning kind of song. And as they sang, great clouds lifted from the eastern sky and the white patches grew bigger and bigger till it was all white and the sea began to shine like silver. And long afterwards, but those who two sang all the time, the east began to turn red and at last unclouded. The sun came up out of the sea and its long level rays shot down the length of the table on the gold and silver and on the stone knife. Once or twice before, the Narnians had wondered whether the sun was as sun at its rising did not look bigger in these seas as it looked at home. This time they were certain. There was no mistaking it, and the brightness of the rays and the dew on the table were far beyond any morning brightness they had ever seen. And as Edmund said afterwards, though lots of things happened on that trip which sound more exciting, that moment was really the most exciting. For now they knew that they had truly come to the beginning of the end of the world. And something seemed to be flying at them out of the very center of the rising sun, but of course no one could look steadily in that direction to be sure. But presently the air became full of voices, voices which took up the same song that the lady and her father were singing, but in far wilder tones and in a language which no one knew. And soon after, the owners of these voices could be seen. They were birds, large and white, and they came by hundreds and thousands and alighted on everything, on the grass, the pavement, on the table, on your shoulders, on your hands, on your head, till it looked as if a heavy snow had fallen. For the snow, for like snow, they not only made everything white, but blurred and blunted all shapes. But Lucy, looking out from between the wings of the birds that covered her, saw one bird fly to the old man with something in its beak that looked like a little fruit, unless it was a little live coal, which it might have been, for it was too bright to look at, and the bird laid it on the old man's mouth. Then the birds stopped their singing and appeared to be very busy about the table. When they rose from it again, everything on the table that could be eaten or drunk had disappeared. These birds rose from their meal in the thousands and hundreds and carried away all the things that could not be eaten or drunk, such as bones and rinds and shells, and took their flight back to the rising sun. But now, because they were not singing, the whir of their wings seemed to set the whole air a tremble. There was in the table, there was the table pecked clean and empty, with the three old lords of Narnia still fast asleep. Now at last the old man turned to the travelers and bade them welcome. Sir, said Caspian, will you tell us how to undo the enchantment which holds these three Narnian lords asleep? I will gladly tell you that, my son, said the old man. To break this enchantment, you must sail to the world's end, or as near as you came to can come to it. Then you must come back, having left at least one of your company behind. What is to happen to that one, asked Reepicheep. He must go on to the utter east and never return into the world. That is my heart's desire, said Reepicheep. And are we near the world's end now, sir? asked Caspian. Have you any knowledge of the seas and the lands farther east than this? I saw them long ago, said the old man, but it was from a great height. I cannot tell you such things as sailors need to know. Do you mean you were flying in the air? Eustace burst it out. It was a long way above the air, my son, replied the old man. I am Ramandu, 
but I see that you stare at one another and have not heard this name. And no wonder, for the days when I was a star ceased long before any of you knew this world, and all the constellations have changed. I'm going to go close my door because it's a little noisy. Hold on. There you go. That's better. Golly, said Edmund under his breath. He's a retired star. Aren't you a star any longer? asked Lucy. I am a star at rest, my daughter, answered Ramandu. When I set for the last time, decrepit and old beyond all that you can reckon, I was called to this island. I'm not so not old now as I was then. Every morning a bird brings me a fireberry from the valley of the sun, and each fireberry takes a little of my age. When I have become as young as a child that I was born yesterday, then I shall take my rising again, for we are at the earth's eastern rim, and once more tread the great dance. In our world, said Eustace, a star is a huge ball of flaming gas. Even in your world, my son, that is not what a star is, but only what it is made of. And in this world, you have already met a star. I believe you have been with Koryakin. That was the magician that made the, the puddle duffs, or the duffel puds, forget their exact name, invisible. Is he a retired star too, said Lucy? Not quite the same, said Ramandu. It is not quite at rest, as that, at rest that he has been set to govern the duffers. You might call it punishment. He might have shown for thousands of years more in the southern winter sky if all had, not, all had gone well. What did he do, sir, said Caspian. My son, said Ramandu, it is not for you, a son of Adam, to know what faults a star can commit. But come, we waste time in such talk. Are you yet resolved? Will you sail further east and come again, leaving one to return no more, and so break the enchantment? Or will you sail westward? Surely, sire, said Reepicheep, there is no question about it. It is very plain part of our quest to rescue these three lords from their enchantment. I think the same, Reepicheep, replied Caspian. And even if it were not so, it would break my heart not to go as near to the world's end as the dawn treader will take us. But I'm thinking of the crew. They signed on to seek the seven lords, not to reach the rim of the earth. If we sail east from here, we sail to find the edge, the utter east. And no one knows how far it is. They're brave fellows, but I see some signs that they are weary of the voyage, and long has our prow been and long to have our prow pointing towards Narnia again. I don't think I should take them further without their knowledge and consent. And then there's poor Lord Roop. He's a broken man. He's the one that they rescued from the darkness. My son, said the star, it would be no use, even though you wished it, to sail to the world's end with men unwilling or men deceived. That is not how great unenchantments are achieved. They must know where they go and why. But who is this broken man you speak of? Caspian told Ramandu the story of Lord Roop. I can give him what he needs most, said Ramandu. In this island, there is sleep without stint or measure and sleep in which no, not the faintest footfall of a dream has ever heard. Let him sit beside the other three and drink oblivion till you return. Oh, do, let's do that, Caspian, said Lucy. I'm sure it's just what he would love. At that moment, they were interrupted by the sound of many feet and voices. Drinian and the rest of the ship's company were approaching. They halted in surprise when they saw Ramandu and his daughter, and then, because they were obviously great people, every man uncovered his head. Some sailors eyed the empty dishes and flagons on the table, and their eyes were filled with regret because they didn't get any of the meal. My lord, said the king to Drinian, pray send two men back to the dawn treader with a message for Lord Roop. Tell him that the last of his old shipmates are here asleep, asleep without dreams, and that he can share it. When this had been done, Caspian told the rest to sit down and laid the whole situation before them. When he had finished, there was a long silence and some whispering until presently, the master bowman got to his feet and said, what some of us have been wanting to ask for a long time, your majesty, is how we're ever to get home when we do turn. Whether we turn here or somewhere else, it's been west and northwest winds all the way, bearing an occasional calm. That doesn't change. I'd like to know what hopes we have of seeing Narnia again. There's not much chance of supplies lasting while we row all the way because the wind has been behind them, pushing them forward. To go back, they'd be going against the wind. <clears throat> That's landman's talk, said Drinian. There's always a prevailing west wind in these seas all through the late summer, 
and it always changes after the new year. We'll have plenty of wind for sailing westward, more than we should like on all accounts. That's true, master, said an old sailor who is a gallowman by birth. You get some ugly weather rolling in here from the east from January and February. And by your leave, sir, if I was in command of this ship, I'd say to winter here and begin the voyage home in March. What would you eat while you were wintering here, asked Eustace. This table, said Ramandu, will be filled with the king's feast every day at sunset. Now you're talking, said several sailors. Your majesties and gentlemen and ladies all, said Rynell. There's just one thing I want to say. There's not one of us chaps who was pressed on this journey. We're volunteers. And there's some here that look very hard at this table and thinking about a king's feast, who are talking very loud about adventures on the day that we sailed from Care Parvel and swearing that they wouldn't come home until they found the end of the world. And there were some standing on the quay who would have given all they had to come with us. It was thought a finer thing to be a ca have a gab cabin boy's berth on the dawn treader than to wear a knight's belt. I don't know if you get the hang of what I'm saying, but what I mean is that I think the chaps who set out like us will look as silly as those duffel puds if we come home and say we got to the beginning of the end world's end but had not the heart to go any farther some of the sailors cheered at this but some said that that was all very well this isn't going to be much fun whispered edmund to caspian what are we to do if half of the fellows hang back wait caspian whispered back i've still a card to play aren't you going to say anything reap a cheap Asked, whispered Lucy. No, why should your majesty expect it? Answered Reepa Cheep in a voice that most people heard. My own plans are made. While I can, I will sail east on the dawn treader. When she fails me, I paddle east in my coracle. When she sinks, I shall swim east with my four paws. And when I can swim no longer, if I have not reached Aslan's country or shot over the end of the world with some vast cataract, I shall sink with my nose to the sunrise and Peepa Keek will be the new head of the talking mice in Narnia. Here, here, said a sailor. I'll say the same, barring a bit about the coracle, which wouldn't bear me, he added in a lower voice. I'm not going to be outdone by a mouse. At this point, Caspian jumped to his feet. Friends, he said, I think you have not quite understood our purpose. You talk as if we have come to you with our hat in our hand, begging for shipmates. It isn't like that at all. We and our royal brother and sister and our kin, their kinsmen, and Sir Reepicheep, the good knight, and the Lord Drinian, have an errand to the world's edge. It is our pleasure to choose among you such as are willing, those who we deem worthy of so high an enterprise. So rather than saying, will you please go? They're saying, maybe we'll pick you. We have not said that any can come for the asking. That is why we shall now command the Lord Drinian and Master Rince to carefully consider what men among you are the hardest in battle, and the most skilled seamen, the purest in blood, and the most loyal to our person, and the cleanest of life and manners, and to give their names to us in a schedule. He paused and went on in a quicker voice. Haslam's mane, he exclaimed. Do you think the privilege of seeing the last, thing, the last things is to be brought on for a song? Well, every man that comes with us shall bequeath the title of Don Treader to all his descendants. When we land at Care Paravel on the homeward voyage, we shall have either gold or land enough to make you, him rich all his life. Now scatter over the island, all of you. In half an hour's time, I shall receive the names that the Lord Drinian has brought to me. It was a rather sheepish silence. Then the crew made their bows and moved away, one in this direction, one in that, but mostly in little knots and bunches talking. And now for the Lord Roop, said Caspian. But turning his head of the table, he saw Roop was already there. He had arrived silent and unnoticed while the discussion was going on and was seated beside the Lord Argos. The daughter of Amandu stood beside him as if she had just helped him into his chair. Amandu stood behind him and laid both hands on Roop's gray head. Even in daylight, a faint silvery light came from the hands of the star. There was a smile on Roop's haggard face. He held out one of his hands to Lucy and the other to Caspian. For a moment, it looked as if you were gonna say something. Then the smile brightened as if you were feeling some delicious sensation. A long sigh of contentment came from his lips. His head fell forward and he slept. Poor Roop, said Lucy, I'm glad. He must have had terrible times. Don't let's even think of it, said Eustace. 
Meanwhile, Caspian's speech, helped perhaps by some magic of the island, was having just the effect he had intended. A good many who had been anxious to get out of the voyage now felt quite differently about being left out of it. And of course, whenever one, any one sailor announced that he had made up his mind to ask for permission to sail, the ones who hadn't said that they felt they were, get, were getting fewer and more uncomfortable. So that before the half hour was nearly over, several people were positively sucking up to Drinian and Rince, at least that's what we'd call it at my school, to get a good report. And soon there were only three left who didn't want to go, and those three were trying very hard to persuade the others to stay with them. And very shortly after that, there was only one left, and in the end, he became afraid of being left behind on, the, on his own and changed his mind. At the end of the half hour, they all came trooping back to Aslan's table and stood at one end while Drinian and Rince sat down with Caspian and made their report. Caspian accepted all the men, but the one who had changed his mind at the last moment. His name was Pittencream, and he stayed on the island of the star all the time with the others while well, they were looking for the world's end, and he very much wished he had gone with them. He wasn't the sort of man who could enjoy talking to Ramandu and Ramandu's daughter, nor they to him, and it rained a good deal, and though there was a wonderful feast on the table every night, he didn't very much enjoy it. it gave him the creeps sitting there alone, and in the rain, as likely as not, with those four lords asleep at the end of the table. And then the others returned. He felt so left out of things that he deserted on the voyage on the, home at the Lone Islands and went and lived in Callerman, where he told wonderful stories about his adventures in the end of the world, until at last he came to believe them himself. So you may say, in a sense, that he lived happily ever after. But he never could bear mice. Because brief cheap. That night, they all ate and drank together at the great table between the pillars, and the feast was magically renewed, and the next morning the dawn treader set sail once more, just when the great birds had come and gone again. Lady, said Caspian, I have spoke, hope to speak with you again when I have broken the enchantments. And Ramandu's daughter looked at him and smiled. I hope you enjoyed that chapter. Um, have a good day. Know that I love you. Bye-bye.